planned on making a video like this, but over the last few weeks I've received so many messages with various links to clips and news articles claiming that DNA has finally unmasked Jack the Ripper. Sounds exciting, right? The problem is, it's completely misleading. Now, I try to be balanced when presenting a case against a suspect, whether the case is strong or poor, because my aim isn't to push an agenda. I don't have one. I just want to present the facts and let you decide. That's what makes the case interesting. However, I have to take issue when people claim that the killer has been identified 100%. It's so clear that the news sources just haven't done the due diligence. This isn't even news. We'll have a look at the evidence, that is the scientific DNA evidence, why these claims have resurfaced and what the implications of this are. So I'm familiar with the case of Erwin Kosminski presented by Russell Edwards in his 2014 book Naming Jack the Ripper. We'll go into this in more detail but in a nutshell the claim is that a silk shawl was taken from Catherine Eddowes after her death by a PC Amos Simpson. It made its way through the hands of various individuals before Edwards eventually bought it in 2007. Edwards then gave the shawl to a Dr Yari Luolainen, a molecular biologist and expert in historic DNA. And Dr Luolainen found DNA on the shawl which was traced to both Catherine Eddowes' descendants and Erin um, Kosminski's family descendants. And Edwards presents this as definitive proof that he's identified Jack the Ripper. Well, I also knew that there were issues with the science that discounted Edwards' claims, and so on the basis of the science alone, I personally dismissed them. So when I saw these latest reports, again mentioning the shawl, I assumed that there must have been further testing, and this time with some valid results. However, disappointingly, this wasn't the case. This reported new evidence is the same evidence from 2014. DNA is one of the most accurate forensic tools around. It's used for so much to confirm parentage, screen for certain genetic disorders, trace ancestry and identify the perpetrators of crimes. An increasing number of cold cases are being solved by DNA matches obtained in crime scene evidence many years later. And although these matches are never 100%, they are close with a probability meaning that it would be absurd to consider that they might match another individual. And over the last few years it's become easy for us to have our own DNA examined if we're curious. I did a 23andMe test a few years ago and it was very accurate in relation to many things about me. It correctly matched me to both of my daughters identifying me as the mother to my sister and it also gave me the correct locations of ancestors where they're from, at least the ones that I know of. So thousands of people have done similar tests and have had these same accurate results. So when we hear claims about DNA, people are understandably swayed. Only the DNA in these cold cases are different. When people are tried and DNA is part of the evidence, there is a jury trial and experts prevent the DNA evidence in great detail. And this is challenged by opposing counsel. But when we hear claims that Jack the Ripper has been identified, we don't have the data. We don't have the expert testimony and we don't have the counter-arguments testing that evidence. We have to take Russell Edwards' word for it, someone who has a vested interest in the findings. So why Aaron Kosminski? Well, I'm not going to get into Aaron Kosminski as a suspect in this video, but he may have been the Kosminski referred to in the McNaughton Memoranda, who had been a suspect for many years. He was born Aaron Mordka Kosminski on the 11th of September 1865 in Kladowa, Poland. He was Jewish and immigrated to England with his family sometime in the early 1880s. And he was alleged to have had severe mental issues and died in Leaveston Asylum in 1919. I understand that Russell Edwards got Kosminski's name from the McNaughton Memoranda where he's described as a woman hater of shoots in particular with strong homicidal tendencies. What about the key evidence in this case? Well the shawl, which I understand is actually a table runner, is alleged to have come from the crime scene of the fourth canonical victim, Catherine Eddowes and she was found on the 30th of September 1888 in Mitre Square by PC Edward Watkins. And the story of the shawl is that acting sergeant PC Amos Simpson went to the mortuary and took the shawl from there with permission because he thought his wife might like it. 
Well, Mrs. Simpson didn't want the shawl, but for whatever reason, they kept it anyway. And when he died, it was passed down through various family members until it found its way into the hands of one who was an antiques dealer. It was always assumed that the shawl belonged to Catherine Eddowes. However, Russell Edwards later came to believe that it had actually belonged to Kosminski. This is because it would have been expensive and Edwards believed that the shawl was Russian. And because tests performed on the dye revealed that the ink was water soluble, it wouldn't have been intact if it had belonged to Catherine Eddowes, who spent a majority of her time outside. And all that does make sense. Edwards believed that Kosminski brought the shawl to the scene of the crime and left it there, perhaps as some kind of clue for the police. But this doesn't make sense. For one thing, it measures eight foot by two foot wide, and it seems like an odd thing to have been carrying around and it would get in the way. And additionally, if he wanted to leave it at a crime scene, did that mean he had to carry it around with him every night when he was looking for a victim? Surely, he was also sometimes exposed to rain, no different to Catherine. And some experts do believe that the shawl could be Russian and is of the correct period. However, there still are several issues with it. Mitre Square, where Catherine Eddowes was found, falls within the boundaries of the City of London Police. Amos Simpson belonged to the Metropolitan Police, an entirely different police force. And there's also some disagreement over whether he was even in the area of the time, because according to contemporaneous records, he was seconded to Hertfordshire at the time. The shawl wasn't included in the list of Catherine's belongings, which you would expect if they had been taken from the mortuary, where all of the items were listed. And the story is that Simpson took the shawl with permission, so you would expect it to have been listed with the other belongings first. It can't have been the case that the other officers had said, go and take it and I'll look the other way, because the clothing wasn't considered to be of any value to the investigation, and they were just destroyed. The other issue is that there's no way to verify that Simpson had the shawl or the chain of ownership. When Russell Edwards bought the shawl, the auctioneers wouldn't vouch for the authenticity. So let's have a look at the main part that I have an issue with, and that's the DNA. So I dug out my university notes to make sure that I was giving the right information on this. And to any of you concerned that my old university notes may not be up to date, you'd be correct, they aren't. Scientific advances are made on a daily basis. But I decided during lockdown that I would pass the time with a new degree from Open University. And it's these university notes that I'm referring to, so only a couple of years old. And I'm by no means an expert, but I do know the basis. Now I love science, but I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it is very important to understand why the DNA evidence isn't what it's claimed to be. So bear with me, I'll try to be quick. So everything in life has DNA. Obviously in this case we're talking about human DNA, and DNA is found everywhere in the human body in its cells. DNA makes up the human genome, and it's 99.9% .9 identical for every human being. And it's this 0.1% that makes us all individual. An individual's genotype is the specific inherited genes that make up that individual, and it's stored in the DNA. When people talk about DNA, they're typically referring to nuclear DNA. In humans, most of the cell's DNA is found in the cell nucleus, and for that reason, it's the most important part of the cell. It's the blueprint for us. There's also a very small amount of DNA in the cell mitochondria, and the mitochondria are primarily involved in energy transformations. So if you're going to analyse a person's DNA, it has to come from the nuclear DNA. And to put that into the context of the subject, Russell Edwards' book, Naming Jack the Ripper, confirms that no nuclear DNA was found on the shawl. What was found was mitochondrial DNA specifically incomplete fragments of mitochondrial DNA. Now, don't get me wrong, mitochondrial DNA is useful and a lot can be learned from it. It's very hardy and it can remain intact much longer than nuclear DNA, so it can be traced back through lineages to the very distant past. So it's very useful in the study of evolution. However, it also has drawbacks because the information that it can provide is very limited and mitochondrial DNA is passed down from a mother to the children, both male and female, but only the female can then pass it on to her children. It contains information about haplogroups, 
large populations of groups, no specifics relating to an individual. So family groups can have the same mitochondrial DNA, but so can groups of people in a country and even a continent. In other words, mitochondrial DNA is useful for tracing maternal ancestry and the areas that they come from, but it doesn't identify individuals. It's nowhere near as conclusive as nuclear DNA. So as Edwards believed that the shawl came from Kosminski, he needed to prove that the bloodstains on the shawl belonged to Catherine Eddowes. Some argue that he may have been hedging his bets here because it was after the mitochondrial DNA rather than nuclear DNA was found that he realised that the shawl belonged to Aaron Kosminski. Because as the shawl was allegedly found with Catherine, it would be more likely to contain her DNA. And if they could find mitochondrial DNA linked to Catherine on Kosminski's shawl, then this would link the two. After all of the investigations, it's claimed that the mitochondrial DNA found in the blood on the shawl matched Catherine Eddowes's great, great, great granddaughter, i.e. They belong to the same haplogroup, T1A1, along with tens of millions of others. And what they believed were semen stains contained mitochondrial DNA that matched Aaron Kosminski's sister's direct descendant. And they belong to the same haplogroup, J2, along with several hundred million others. It's impossible for mitochondrial DNA to provide definitive proof. The usual practice for studies such as this is to submit these to a scientific journal for peer review and these research papers must be written in a certain format and this includes a method in order that an experiment can be reproduced and the results tested. And you would think that such an important discovery would be published, wouldn't you? However, this wasn't the case. The only publication of the findings were contained in Russell Edwards' book in 2014. And Edwards heavily relied on a finding in relation to a mutation contained in the mitochondrial DNA. DNA constantly copies itself within our bodies and as this happens mistakes are made in various ways and this causes mutations and this is the basis for difference and for change and in the long term evolution. So a relatively recent mutation in evolutionary terms, so a hundred years or so, can allow some specificity because it wouldn't have had time to spread throughout the population. In the book, the DNA match, not to Aaron Kosminski, which is what you would expect given the proof is that Aaron Kosminski has been identified as the Ripper, but actually to Catherine Eddowes. And this relies on a rare mutation found in mitochondrial DNA, which is 314.1c. However, Dr. Lua Lyon had made a mistake. It was actually 315.1c, which is present in approximately 40 to 70% of people of European descent. So it's possible that many of us have this specific mutation and it's useless for identifying an individual or even a family. In March 2019, the Journal of Forensic Sciences published a study carried out by Liverpool John Moores University where Dr. Lua Linen is a senior lecturer and the University of Leeds analysing the mitochondrial DNA that had been extracted from the shawl, along with the samples from the female descendants of Catherine Eddowes and descendants of Kuzminski's sister. It was determined that there was a match for both. However, and I can't state this strongly enough, the data published in the study didn't support the determination. And in simple terms, it's like saying that the data determined that the answer was seven, but the data was two and two, and the method was that you add them together. It doesn't add up. The Journal of Forensic Sciences later printed an expression of concern about the study, and that's a notice by the publisher that the study is untrustworthy or may contain errors. An expression of concern is not to be taken lightly in the scientific community and these are usually published when there's an ongoing investigation into scientific misconduct.
make of that what you will. So what do we have? Well we have a shawl that allegedly comes from either Catherine Eddowes or Aaron Kosminski, though this can't be conclusively proven. I don't know if it did or not. I kind of hope it did because maybe in the future some good use can be made of it. We don't have an identification. No individuals have been identified by DNA. We don't have a DNA profile, not even a partial one. Everyone agrees that there was no nuclear DNA and this would be the only way to identify an individual. The DNA that was extracted from the shawl, the mitochondrial DNA, can be narrowed down to match several million people around at the time of the murders. It's no more specific than that. And of course, even if there was an individual's DNA on the shawl, it would mean just that there was DNA on a shawl. A shawl allegedly at a murder site, admittedly. But that doesn't mean that that DNA belonged to the person that killed Catherine Eddowes. It just means that they somehow came into contact. So why is this news again now? Well, it seems that Russell Edwards has made attempts to obtain legal permission to exhume Aaron Kosminski's grave to test his DNA. I also understand that some of the victim's descendants are pushing for a legal inquest in relation to this, so it's likely that the news agencies have picked up on all of this and are simply recycling the DNA story as new. Now, I accept you can't be aware of every book on every subject. I get it, but it's a bit lazy. News stations are authoritative. In my opinion, they have a responsibility to look into what they're reporting as fact. That is, how old this news is, and more importantly, how accurate. Again, it was 11 years ago, and there have been criticisms of this, and an expression of concern. None of these have been mentioned. Although the family's desire for justice is understandable, unless new, indisputable evidence emerges, further official investigation seems meaningless. Even if Aaron Kosminski was exhumed and his DNA obtained, given the sheer number of people who share the same haplogroup, it may well match. It would likely match many of you watching, along with millions of others. What would we use the individual DNA profile for? There isn't a profile on the shore for comparison. This doesn't seem like anywhere near sufficient evidence to exhume a grave. It sets a dangerous precedent in terms of legal and ethical concerns. Do we consider exhuming the grains of every Jack the Ripper suspect? So has DNA finally unmasked Jack the Ripper? No. So while DNA evidence doesn't bring us any closer to identifying Jack the Ripper, it certainly adds another layer of complexity to an already baffling case. But the mystery doesn't end there. In the next video, we're going to take a closer look at one of the most infamous suspects in the Ripper case, Prince Albert Victor. While his name has been linked to the crimes for many years, there are some things about his potential involvement that often are overlooked, and we'll look at why his connection to the murders is far more speculative than you might think, and why it's important to approach this theory with caution. It's a theory that's been recycled time and time again, but is there something more to it that we haven't fully examined? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.